you guys a little bit about layout and usually you want to pull layout in a certain way so that um, when people are putting whatever surface is going on the outside of this wall on there that it's going to break and what I mean by break is that it's going to split a stud or it's going to end on a, on a good spot so that um, the person can fasten the edge of that sheet and then start a new one on the same stud. So um, yeah so we got, we got our studs we got our cripples, we got our header, trimmers, king studs. Alright, what about what's sandwiching all this stuff? 
Um, top and bottom plane. So yeah. So the whole beginning of the process, whenever we're starting to lay out a wall, um, you start with your top and your bottom plate. And so usually there's going to be, so we'll go through the whole steps in framing a wall right now. So um, what you want to do is you want to start out with the foundation that's square, or the foundation that's square that you'll have to square up yourself, and then you also want it to be flat. Um, so whenever you square up a foundation, you got to use a little bit of mathematics here. So, can anybody tell me what that is? A right triangle. It's a right triangle. It's, a, it's not very, you know, yeah, it's a right triangle, exactly. Um, so whenever we're snapping on a, so say that, you know, this is what you're going to build your house on right here. You want to make sure that whatever you're going to be standing your walls on ends up being on a square surface. That way, all, all in all, all these walls come together in one perfect square box. Um, so you always want to figure out how to get one of these corners square, and then from there it becomes easier, and I'll kind of explain to you guys how. Um, but in order to find this, the math that's involved here, can anybody tell me what it is? Three, four, five. What's the technical term? Six, eight, twelve. Six, eight, twelve. Okay. So, A squared plus B squared plus C squared. Okay. It's the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem. There we go. Man, we got some smart people in here today. Okay. So, uh, just like what Dave was saying, three, four, five. And so, that's usually how uh, carpenters go about squaring out their foundation. So, um, typically, if I were to come up to a slab, that has nothing on it, there's no lines made for me. I don't want to just go with the edge of whatever that foundation is. You never can assume that that's just going to be square all in all. So you want to make sure that it becomes square. The one way that you do that is you snap yourself a control line. I always find the longest wall and the straightest wall. And then I'll pull my whatever dimension it is, uh, whether it's 2x4 or 2x6, and I'll snap three and a half or five and a half inches. Now that we're on that subject, I'm gonna switch gears for just one second. We'll just get sidetracked for a little bit. Uh, can everybody tell me, yeah, how wide a two by four is? I just said. Num, uh, uh, actual. It's one and a half by three and a half. One and a half by three and a half, exactly. So these lumber companies and people that, you know, started the whole construction industry, they wanted to make it difficult on us carpenters, and so they say that something's a two by four, but it's not actually a two by four. And so um, that's its nominal measurement is two inches by four inches. But after it's all sanded down on all the sides, all four sides, and smooth, then all in all, the actual measurement, actual dimension, is an inch and a half by three and a half. And then so and so on and so forth. So then a two by six would be an inch and a half by five and a half. Um, can anybody tell me what a two by eight would be? Seven and a quarter. Bam! Seven and a quarter. And then somehow it just changes to quarters from there on out. So, um, inch and a half by seven and a quarter would be a two by eight. Uh, inch and a half by eleven and a quarter would be a two by twelve. Uh, so on and so forth. Ten and a quarter for two by nine. Nine and a quarter. Sorry. Anyways. So anyways, now that we got that all figured out, so say you have two, a two by six exterior wall right here. So I would find the straightest wall, snap my control mark. So I'd most likely pull off six inches on either side. Can anybody tell me why I'd do six inches instead of five and a half? Half, uh, half inch for sheeting. Half inch for sheeting. Because usually you'd want your sheeting to end up being flush with that block right there. So depending on how the foundation is, I'd probably go through and make sure that it was accounted for, that the slab, you know, was made to have that half inch of sheeting be flush, whatever. If the sheeting is hanging over, not the end of the world. But anyways, six on either side. There's usually some kind of variance in all the block, block or concrete. I wish it was a perfect world out here. Nothing is always perfect. Anyway, so I'd snap that. Is all is all sheeting? Is it all half inch or is it some five eighths? Uh, yes. So it is. Uh, it, it it's not all half inch. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so it varies. You can you can buy lots of different th thicknesses of sheeting. Uh, the most common maybe is half inch. 
um, 7 16 5 8 3 quarter. Um, typically on the exterior of a building, you're going to use something that's 7 16 or half inch, something that's on the roof, uh, half inch, maybe go a little bit thicker with 5 8 uh, and on your subfloor, usually you go with a thicker uh, sheeting as well, and that can be anywhere from three quarters to around an inch and an eighth. And so those are the different types of sheeting that you guys are going to see. Out here on this job site, all of our subfloor, that's going to be three quarter. Our roof sheeting is five eighths, and then basically all the wall sheeting that we're putting on our shear walls out here is seven sixteenths. So, and those are all actually measured in 30 seconds rather than, uh, you know, eighths. So, um, 19, 30 seconds, would there be what, Zach? Uh, three quarter. Five eighths. Five eighths. <laughs> so, brush up on my it's one of those things where, like, usually, yeah, it measures it by 30 seconds rather than the 60. So, get your control line set, and then pull your <coughs> five and a half out because you want this wall to end up be five and a half there. So now you have crosshairs right here. And so like what Dave was saying, you can do three, four, or five. So if you go three feet in one dimension, you're gonna go four in, the other, in one direction, you can go four foot in the other direction. And then, uh, you. so just to keep it simple, so we'll go three foot over here, and then four foot over here. And the way that I'm gonna do that is when I, I'll have somebody hold me at that crosshairs right there, I'll pull out that three foot and I'll use my tape measure and I'll kind of scribe a line there. And then at that crosshair, or hold it this way, go that way, scribe my four foot, and then I'll have this person switch gears and come over to this intersection of where that three foot line meets my control line and then I'll pull directly across and then scribe another line at five foot. So I have three, four, five, and then that means this all in all is gonna be square if I shoot this line right here directly through these two crosshairs that were made with the four and the five. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Can I explain that good enough? Yeah. So square foundation is where you wanna start out. Next, you're gonna wanna start with laying out your floor and so that essentially is just going off of these two lines you want to make sure that you have a foundation that's going to be completely snapped out from there um, so after you have a square corner the easiest way to go about doing that is you pull parallel directly across one way or another and so pull this across to this dimension you know whatever it is down here you make the same up there you can snap that line through and then whatever, so there I would go another five and a half, six inches, pull it directly across, see what that is, do the same thing on the top, go five and a half inches here, pull that directly across, do the same thing to the other side. That way you know that you have a square corner and all your lines are parallel, you have a perfectly square box. And then based off of the plans, you'll go through and you'll snap the other lines down on the ground. And you'll do that by pulling off of these control lines that you now have on the exterior of your foundation. And all the interior walls are going to be, they'll vary depending on what type of place you're building and what the house model is going to look like. So snapping out the floor, that's all done. Now you want to pull dimensions for your top and bottom plates. So we'll get rid of that. And I'm sorry again for having terrible art skills. So usually, say this is an interior wall, there's a corner right here. And so this is a wall and this is a wall. So next step in the process, when you go to actually build the walls, whether this is exterior or interior, you want to pull this dimension whatever this is. So say the wall stops right here and it butts into an exterior wall right there. So you can build this wall right here one of two ways. You can build this wall to go all the way through down to there or you can build this wall to stop right there and then this wall can run all the way through over to there. So when you guys do that I would say you know it, it depends on 
it all depends on you know what the what it looks like in, in there. So usually, if this wall were to continue all the way through, for instance, I would stop that wall short. So then that way I could build, and then maybe there's another wall right here that comes into it. Stop this wall short so that you can build this entire wall after these two walls are stood and stand it up to go right into those two walls. So, um, and that it just takes a little bit of practice to you know, kind of get an eye on it. Um, but, anyways, so uh, you can stop it there or you can run it all the way through. If you do that, uh, you always have to make sure that you have backing one way or another for the intersecting walls. And so there's a couple different ways that we can go about doing that. And I can show you here. So the most common way for a corner, or for a wall that goes into a corner like this, and when I talk about backing, this is another term that is used often in framing. And so backing is there to carry drywall and to connect other walls together. So usually this wall right here, if this were to run all the way through, you'd want to stop it with what we call a cal quarter, California quarter. So you would take this just like that and nail these two guys together and then that way this would be positioned on the end of the wall right here. And I'm sorry, I don't know you guys. I've been in the entire time. <laughs> so, push, position this right here so then that way um, when, you, when, when you stand this wall and you stand this wall, there's an additional little bit of stud coming out of the wall right there. So that way, you can nail this wall into that, and then when they go to do drywall, when it's all said and done, the drywall has something to catch right there in that part. So, um, back to the second step. Sorry, I kind of jumped all over the place here. So you want to pull your dimensions for the top and bottom plate, um, and then your next step in the process is going to be to lay out your window openings and wall channels in your wall before you stand your wall. Um, after that, you're going to want to pull the rest of the remaining layout across the wall. Typically layout is what? Can someone tell me how far studs are usually spaced apart? 16 inches on center. 16 inches on center. That is correct. So you want to go through after all of your wall channels or and doorways, windows, whatever you have, all your big components of the wall. Lay those out first, figure out where they go and then you want to come back through and lay out for your studs. Um, next part of the process, so here, we'll write this down for you guys and then we can kind of go through it all together. So we want to lay out the floor. Full dimensions for plates. Layout openings and wall channels. center usually. Next, uh, you'll want to cut your wall components. And that step in the process, what I mean by, what I mean by cutting your wall components, you want to go through and cut your studs, cut your trimmers, cut your header. Um, so we'll pause at that for a second. When you go through, I mean this is a very important step in the process, so when you're building a wall, you always want to make sure you have it at the right height. 
lots of the time, especially so like out here on our job site, they send us uh, pre-cut studs. Um, so all in all, uh, typical wall height for our interior walls ends up being nine foot one and an eighth. So um, four and a half inches off of nine foot one and an eighth is what, Matt? What? 104 and five One oh four and five eighths. That's correct. So that's um, a common dimension for a pre-cut stud. Same with 92 and 5 eighths. So that it ends up being eight foot in the end. So um, when you guys go, go through to figure out what your wall height is, the best way to do it is you say we want to build a wall in here. So you want to measure from your floor of whatever surface that you're building on. all the way up to your ceiling or whatever surface it, you're going to, going to attach to. So, you got 96 inches there. And then you have how many plates, which add up to how many inches? You got three plates. Four and a half. Four and a half inches. So, what are you minusing off? Or what does that end up being? 96 minus four and a half inches. Right? This is what you guys want your finished stud to end up being. 92 and a half inches. So, 91, 91 and a half. 91 and a half. Yes. 91 and a half? 91 and a half. You are 100% correct. <laughs> so, uh, you're supposed to do the math for me, man. Come on. Make it easy. So, 91 and a half. So, now that you guys have your stud dimension of whatever your studs need to be, you can, after you pull your layout, you usually want to bring over a stack of whatever it is that you're going to be cutting up. You'll lay your studs down, and you'll cut your, your studs to whatever dimension they need to be, and then you can go ahead and can figure out if there's a window on the wall um, or a door, then you can figure out the trimmer height for that. So, um, for instance, uh, a trimmer, a, Trimmer height for a normal door usually, uh, you want the header of your door, RO, to usually be at 6 foot 10 and a half inches. So, can anybody tell me? So if that's where your header is sitting at, how high would you want your trimmers to be? Well, how, how wide is the header? Yeah. Uh -huh. We're just talking about height right now. Dave had it over there, I heard him say it. So, six foot ten and a half, you want to minus an inch and a half off because this one is only sitting on that bottom plate, right? So, you want six foot ten and a half off of your finished floor for your RO. And by RO, I <laughs> mean rough opening. Sorry, are you guys following me? <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So, uh, you you want to minus off an inch and a half. For, the, for that trimmer height, so that after it's sitting on that bottom plate, so if you're six foot nine. you want your own bottom plate, then jack stud, Bam. Then, your, then your trimmer. That then is your correct. Head. Bottom plate, yeah. then your trimmer, and then your header sits right on top of that. So um, if your header height is going to be six foot ten and a half, minus off an inch and a half, because that inch and a half bottom plate right there, so you'll cut your trimmers at six foot nine. So then that way, it's sitting on that inch and a half, when it's all said and done, it ends up being six foot ten and a half. So this is the math that you want to do at the beginning when you're going through and build your wall. You want to figure out whatever your trimmer height's going to be, whatever your stud height's going to be, go through and you'll measure all this. Um, back to like the header, like you were saying. So if we're cutting a header and say that we have two trimmers on either side um, and it's going to be a 36 inch opening, 36 inch RO. How big would your header be, Angie? Uh, and it's sitting on two by fours, not anything fancy. And it's a 36 inch rough opening? Correct. Uh -huh. So, yeah, say it. Yeah, we'll say this is 36 inches, and there's two trimmers here. So I'm adding those up. Uh, no, you got two yep, and so you guys were saying before so that the trimmers support the weight of the header, and then all in all, the king studs 
we'll sandwich those in and run all the way up beside the header. So you're going to end up adding six inches. So three inches to either side. Each two by four is going to be an inch and a half. So you got three inches here and three inches here. So you want to make sure that you're cutting your header six inches bigger than whatever the opening is going to be. Yes. What? Why two trimmer studs in there? Uh, well, this this wall. Okay. Well, you wouldn't need one because it's 30, a 36 inch opening. So technically, you would probably only need um, one trimmer. But depending on the building, if you have a large five story building, uh, a structural engineer might call out for having more trimmers and more king studs. And so, um, usually, whenever you're building a project like this. Uh, it comes with a couple different sets of prints. There will be an architectural set and then a structural set. In the structural set, you go through and you'll be able to find um, what's known as a header schedule. And your header schedule uh, is what the engineer goes through and he does all the math to figure out how much weight can be supported in a certain wall. So, um, he will then specify how many trimmers, how many king studs, and what size header would be, be needed in a certain wall. So out here, um, like on the first floor, the first floor is bearing the most weight in our five-story building. So you guys are going to see that there's going to be more trimmers and more king studs in lots of these walls than there would be as you go up. Because yeah, as you go up, you're not putting as much pressure on the top of the building and pushing down. Residential so, homes, it's anything over 36 inches, generally it's a double. Correct. It's just a given. Yep. 36 inches, I believe, up to 8 foot. Yeah, then it goes to triple. And then it goes to triple after that. The only different style header would be white, would be LVLs or other stuff. What's that? Will those be built ahead? So, uh, it. It all depends. Usually, um, engineers, they call it for a double ply header. Um, sometimes they call it for a double ply header with half inch in between. So say that you have a, a two by four wall and you're putting in a header in there. Um, they usually, they'll call it out to have a half inch packed in between. That way it takes up that entire three and a half inches of that two by four wall. Lots of the time, uh, Whenever, like, uh, so I'm currently building a house right now, and it calls for a double fly LVL header, and it does not call it out to be packed out. So, what we do is typically flush that header to the outside, um, and for convenience of building the wall and having drywall backer already built in, we'll go through and we'll nail on like a two by six on the top. And then we'll fill one in underneath. We'll raise that header up an inch and a half on the bottom. And so that way, um, there's not really a big jog in the wall. So your cripples, as you stand up the wall and look on the back side, your cripples are going to come down flush to the edge of that 2x6 while your header will be inset so that it's flush with the exterior. And then there will be another 2x6 beneath it. That way, when they go to do drywall on the back side of that wall, it's going to have enough surface area. To, to fasten to. Right there. So, anyways, uh, headers in a nutshell. Do you, does anybody else have a question on headers? Oh, are, are headers typically like, uh, like the size of them, are they typically like 2 by 10 or 2 by 12s? Yeah, so uh, usually what you guys are going to see for header material will be anywhere from I've seen as low as a 2x6, but that's usually not something that's that's used. More commonly, it'll be a 2x8 to a 2x12. And then, like what Dave was saying, uh, it'll be engineered wood, like an LVL, that is used for a header. So, and those dimensions also vary. Yes. Uh, can you use the same headers for windows and doors? Could you say, yes, I mean, all in all, you could. And so, um, usually, like I was saying, it depends on whatever is called out in the structural set of prints. Or you can look into the building code for the certain area, and it tells you how many, for what size opening is called out. So, for instance, I believe that Minnesota building code in a residential aspect is a 36 inch 
uh, opening. It'll call for, I, I believe, two 2x10 two headers with a single trimmer and a king stone. Don't quote me on that. I have to look it up just to make sure. But So you can always resort back to uh, your code book and take a look at whatever opening size it may be, and then it'll tell you how many trimmers and king studs that you're going to need in there as well. Yeah, generally when you do headers, you always, always, always flush up the outside. Uh, if you leave the air gap, because the glass isn't the same thickness, if you leave the air gap towards the outside, uh, almost every inspector will make you tear it out. It'll, it'll create a, an area for frost, because the heat will actually get in there and it'll create an area for frost so that the insulation barrier is uh, broken. So just FYI, I always flush them up to the outside. Exactly. All right, so what we have here so far, we got laying out the floor, pulling dimensions from the plates, uh, laying out your openings and your wall channels, pulling your layout, whatever it may be, 16 inches on center. You may notice that in this building that we're doing right now, that layout uh, changes from, uh, it's not 16 inches on center in a lot of our partition walls, it's 24 inches on center. Um, and the reason that they did that in this building, the engineer made it so that everything stacks going up and down the entire building. So um, our truss layout is also 24 inches on center, and our trusses bear directly on top of where these stud packs are. And that transfers all the way up the building, so then that load is carried properly throughout the entire, the entire building. So um, pull your layout, cut your wall components. After you guys are gonna cut your wall components, you're gonna wanna go through and you'll nail all that stuff together. So you, now you have your trimmer measurements, you have your stub measurements, you have your header measurements, um, you have whatever uh, backing you may need for intersecting walls. So now this is a time where you go through and you'll build your corners, you'll build your wall channels if there's a wall intersecting in the middle of it somewhere. You can go back to my crappy drawing here. So right there, there's a wall that intersects into there. Lots of time people like to put a wall channel in that. It looks really nice um, and it acts as a great way to tie the, tie the walls into each other. Um, sometimes people, people do this in a number of different ways. Uh, you can use what's known as ladder blocking and you can go up. So if there's a stud right there and a stud right there, you can block in between those every 16 inches to two feet all the way up that wall. And then you can tie this wall into that like that um, lots of time people like to use a U-channel to do that, and so what that would look like is something like this. So this would be a U-channel, just like that. As you can see, it makes a U. <laughs> yes, I can. No, I said it could be a C. Oh, it could be a C. Yeah, it could be. But anyways, so put this together, and then that way, this flat piece, this 2x4 that's flat right here, that ends up being right there on that wall, and then you have a stud on that side and a stud on that side, and it covers backing in all corners, and it gives you a nice piece of 2x4 right on the back side of that wall to nail it all the way up and down. So that's one way that you can go about doing it. You can do ladder blocking at the end. You can do another, you can do a number of different things in that aspect. But anyways, so that step in the process, step in the process, nail together. Uh, channels, king trimmer, hacks. So you do that, now you have your layout, you have all your components nailed together, all your measurements, you're almost ready to start building the wall. Not quite. So you want to get everything lined up where it needs to go. So you keep those two plates kept together, and this is an important step in the process. Some people like to do a little bit different. I think that this is the best way to go about building a wall. Um, so uh, keep your two plates together that you have your layout pulled, and then you go through and you'll line up all your studs 
throughout the wall, line up your door, your king trimmer packs, where those need to go. Once that's all aligned, then you can pull your plates. Um, as you guys are spreading your, your components of the wall, your studs, can anybody tell me an important piece of information that needs to happen while you're doing that? Anybody? You want to you make sure that you guys, you guys are like grading your lumber. So you want to make sure that you're crowning, crowning your studs. Correct. So what I mean by a crown of a stud is you want to look down a stud flat like this. So the stud, if it has some kind of rainbow to it, or if it has some kind of curve like a banana, either direction, that's going to be a crown. And so typically, whenever I'm framing, I crown my studs up, all of my studs. So then that way, when you stand the wall, all of your studs are going to align a lot better on that side of the wall. If you guys don't crown your studs and they end up you know, having a crown down and a crown up all over the place, now your studs are going to go kind of all over the place and the drywaller is not going to like you very much. So, and it, it's just a bad practice in prepping. So this is a very important step. You always want to make sure that you guys are crowning your studs. So you go through, do that, and you guys will see this when we step outside here in a minute to go build this wall. We'll make sure that we're crowning our studs. And, yes. So, at that point, so is there a preference then? So once you crown them, like should that crown go towards the outside inside? Does it matter? I usually I I prefer my crown to go towards the outside. Okay. So then the wall isn't necessarily bowed out on the inside. Yeah. Well, it's gonna be nice and finished in the end. That's typically what I always do. So. Okay. Alright. So from there, spread your plates. After you spread your plates, you get everything nice and aligned on the layout on the bottom, on the layout on the top. And now you guys are going to go through and frame your wall. And how many studs do you put in a 2x4? Or how many nails do you put in a 2x4? <laughs> as many as you need to. Alright, Ross. So, two nails per stud on a 2x4. You can have up to three. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we don't have to go there right now. Um, <laughs> two by six, how many nails? Three. Three. Three nails and a two by six. So there's a strategic method at building walls. And the way that I like doing it the best is you start in one corner and you have a nice, look at this here. Oh, well, you got this right here. You got a nice square right here. So I'll start right here in this corner, because I'm right-handed, and I'm holding my nail gun in the right hand. So I'm going to walk around this wall counterclockwise. Go around just like that, holding my nail gun, and I'm always walking forward. Put this wall in, make sure it's nice and flush. To, put this stud in, nice and flush to the edge. That guy, that guy, that guy, so on and so forth. Um, I usually will leave out our cripples. Um, till the end, or you can go through and you can do the math and figure out whatever that needs and you can put it in beforehand. I usually like to go through um, and nail off all my studs, nail off my king stud trimmers, and then I'll come through and I'll put my header in, and I even like to leave out these couple studs on the edge here. Why do, why do I like to do that? Can anybody tell me why? I like to leave them off? Matt? You tell me? So you can nail your header off from the side because it, it works out a lot better if you can, it holds the wall a lot better if you can nail your header off through, directly through that king stud. So if you have a double king stud, if that's what it calls out for, I like to leave off that second king stud and I'll come through and I'll nail it on the first one and then I'll put my second one on there and that way it's fast and nice. If you don't do that, then a lot of time you're stuck toe nailing your header in. And You'll end up with gaps, it doesn't hold as good, doesn't look as good, isn't that structural. So, leave out the components that are next to your header, go through, put all your studs in, put your header in, and now that your header's in, you can measure what your cripples are be, can be, or are supposed to be, sorry, I don't want to speak English today, um, and put your, put your cripples in, and then you can determine whatever your sill height needs to be from there is usually when I try to figure that out. So if I have a five foot a height, 
a window that's five foot all in all. I will butt this right here, pull down with my tape measure, make a mark at five foot and an inch and a half further because that's where my sill is going to sit directly across this wall. Am I going too fast for you guys? Is this, are you guys understanding this? Okay, alright. So, put that sill directly, or, so from there, I'll measure from here down to the bottom plate. That tells me what that bottom cripple needs to be. Go through and I'll nail that on the side, nail that on the side, and through the bottom, nail these guys through the bottom, take that sill, match the layout of whatever it is right there, put that guy on there, nail off your sill, now you guys got a beautiful window in your wall. That makes sense? You want to go over layout real quick? Yeah, I do want to go over layout. You want to put one on so you know you're happy? Yes. Absolutely. So, I'm trying to, I'm going to pull up these style here real quick. showed you guys and then that way when I go to stand that wall it's gonna have that backing readily available to tie in the other wall to it and to have drywall backing when it's all set up. So we have that corner there we'll go through we'll mark our window opening here first. So what do we got there? So we got eight foot three eighths. So what's we'll happening eight foot three eighths? Four foot three sixteenths. So find my center, four foot three three sixteen, just like that. So now I got a three foot window. We'll say. Actually, let's go with the door, just because I haven't shared this piece of information with you guys. Whenever you guys are framing a door, you guys always want to frame it bigger usually. So if somebody tells you there's a thirty six inch door that's going into it, does anybody know how wide you usually want to frame? It? Two, two inches bigger. So, you got a 36 inch door, you guys want to frame it 38 inch, 38 inches. So, um, that means, so if it's going to be framed out to be 38 inches in the end, we're going to want to go 19 inches either direction. So, I'll place a 19 on that center mark right there. I'll make a mark like that. Keeping my tape measure right there, pull that directly across, mark my 38 inches, and then you can always verify and check. Yep, you got 19 inches right there. So, this is just a non-load bearing wall, you want to just put a king stud and a trimmer in it. 
So from there we'll come through on this edge, because this is your opening that you guys want right here. Mark that guy off right there. Trimmer, trimmer, king stud, king stud. Do the same thing. And so if you guys see me sliding my square, there's these handy dandy little notches in your square that tell you the distance of how, how far it is. So I just push it over to where it's an inch and a half spacing and then I know that that trimmer right there is going to be sitting in that inch and a half spot and that king set's going to be sitting right there in that inch and a half spot. You see how I did that? So we always know that we're going to have a stud on the end. Marking with X's is what I always do. Now, you can go through and you can um, you do it a couple different ways. Usually you just go, some people like to go through and they just mark 16 and then that's the center of their stud. Um, technically we have, we're hooking the edge of the stud right here. So we can just go 16 like that and go. And what I mean by end go, this means that's going on, it's going to continue going, whatever direction it is that you're pulling your layout from. So 16 and go, we'll go through and we can mark that. So this is just the door, and on the bottom plate, that the bottom plate of your door, that's going to get cut out. So there's not really any reason for you guys to make any marks down there. But what's going to be above your header of your door? Cripples. Cripples. So just so that I know that it's not going to be a stud there, I'll mark that 16 and then I'll put a C for a cripple. Sometimes people will get a little confused and don't like it because some people mark center as C, but usually the center will have a line directly through that C. So mark it and C is to the side. Pull that guy right there. We got another stuff there. There we go. All of your studs are spaced. Line it all up. Make sure you guys have your X's top and bottom. Now you guys have your two plates laid out. This is where you guys are going to want to go through. So you laid out your openings and your wall channels. Opening, wall channels in it. Pull your layout 16 on center after that's all laid out. Cut your wall components. Um, so I'll go through and I'll cut whatever my trimmers need to be. So say I want my uh, header height to be at 82 inches. So uh, yes. So you pull you pull your measurement from the end there, which doesn't account then for that end stud. So isn't that gap then less than 16? Yes. That. So the gaps are for a wall that's going to be 16 on center. Your gaps are always going to be 14 and a half inches. But so if I were to go, so there's the stud right here. So we can just do this real quick. So we can mark an inch and a half. And then this is going to be an inch and a half too. And the 16 on center measurement, center of that to center of that is 16. You want it to the center of your stud. It doesn't matter. I mean, does it two. matter? Yeah, it matters. Of course it matters. <laughs> um, so on a 16 on center wall, I, I've always gone by the rule of thumb that you never want this spacing here in between your studs to be more than 16. Technically on a 16 on center wall, this spacing between should always be 14 and a half inches. So, so when you were doing your marking, were you marking the edge of the 2x4? I was marking, yes. Okay. So I was okay. marking the edge, sorry if I did not clarify that. So marking the edge and then I was marking on my X on the other side. That X is telling me where I want to place that stud. So, like I was saying, people do this a number of different ways. Sometimes people just like to go through and they'll just pull 16, they'll mark it, and that's their center. And um, if you're pulling from the edge like this, it this stud spacing right here, this spacing right here isn't 
the most important. It's not super crucial that this needs to be that 14 and a half inches. So you could just go 16 right there on center, and that's your center of your stud. You can pull this, and that's the center of your stud, that's the center of your stud, that's the center of your stud. This spacing right here is just going to be a little bit less than that 14 and a half inches, which is completely fine. Cool. Um, what, what the way I usually do it is uh, <laughs> so this is so yes, 15 and a quarter. So can you tell me why I would do something like that? Something that crazy you can, like that. You can do the 15 and a quarter mark your line, and then you can draw the X. That way, you don't have to like eyeball the center of the stud. You can just line the edge of the stud with your line, and you know the X is where you're going to put the stud. So, right, yeah, uh, essentially, yes. And so, like, for like, no, for those interior, for an interior wall like this, like I was saying, the that first measurement, if you want to just, if you want to go 16 and go by hooking the edge of the wall all the way across, you're gonna go 16 and back all the way across. Or if you want to do your 16 on center all the way across, all those are sufficient methods. Um, I always just try to pick one and stick with that all the way throughout. But what's important, uh, if you guys are doing like the exterior of a building. This is where layout gets very important, and you want to make sure that you're doing it right. So, so say this is right here, this marks the edge of my building on the outside. So now, rather than just pull 16 and mark the other side, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull three quarters of an inch back and mark that on all my layouts. Can anybody tell me what? Can you, you got another reason that's why I would do that? Cheating. Cheating. Exactly. So that way, when I go to sheet the outside of that building, and I make this nice and flush on this edge right here, that's going to end up being four foot right there on the center of that, on that stud, all the way across. You guys follow me? Mm -hmm. So I typically, just at, out of habit, like even on like my interiors, I'll go through and I'll, I'll hook and I'll just pull 15 and a quarter, I'll just go three quarters back all this and if you guys notice I'm always marking these making these marks like right here where these two plates sandwich each other that way if there's any variance you can push these together and that's they're nice and tight right on top of each other um, we'll be at three quarters back and go just like that all the way across A stud right over there on the end. Um, but when I will, so like say for instance, this comes to be the end of my, oops, my wall right here. So I don't want to mark that three quarters back and go um, because I like to end my walls with a full stud. So rather than do that, I'm going to pull three quarters ahead of that mark and end my wall right there. So then rather than it being this back edge of the stud that I'm marking, I'm marking that front edge and I'm going to cut my plate right there. So, so I'll mark that right there. Come through, put these together like that. And then I'm going to cut that right there because when I go to start my next wall, I'm going to start with another full stud. Sometimes people like to just keep doing it the same way and then they'll start, they'll rather than uh, start their wall with another full stud on the edge, they'll have this stud just hanging halfway off of that top and bottom plate and they'll bring their other wall in and kind of shove it in and then that that stud splits that top and bottom plate and brings those two walls together. I don't like that. I think that's a lot cleaner just to start with end with a stud and start with another one. That way you know that it's nice and secure on the top and bottom and you can completely tie these two walls together. Did I say that too fast? Do you guys see what I did there? Because then as you're sheeting so that center of that stud, rather than it breaking on the center of this stud, it's going to break right on the end of that wall. So your sheet will end up being flush with that, that outside edge of the stud. 
and then your next sheet will have another full stud that it can nail to to start off with, so on and so forth. <coughs> All right, well, uh, I kind of kind of burned up a lot of time. I'd like to get you guys out there and demonstrate framing a wall real quick. Um, I'm just going to burn through everything else that I had to say real fast, and we'll go out there, and then I'd like to go through a wall standing process just real quick if you guys have time to stick around for a few minutes. Uh, are you guys learning stuff today? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, after you're, yeah, you nail your studs, or you put your components together, keep your two plates sandwiched like that, lay out all those components they are nailed together. After everything's laid out in front of these two plates, then you take the one plate and you bring it back and you start walking around the wall and start nailing them off. Um, what do you do after you nail the wall together? Okay, what do you do? You have a wall built, ready to go. You stand it. You stand the wall, man. You stand the wall. So, uh, usually if you're standing on the wall and it goes to concrete, it'll go to, you'll glue it down and you can secure it to the ground in a couple different ways. You can use um, concrete anchors, there's sometimes on a foundation there'll be threaded rod that comes up on the outside and that's what you're going to secure it to. Or you can use a powder gun is what people, like a, a ram set or a hilti gun and you can, it just shoots a, a pin directly into the concrete. Um, so you can do that on concrete, otherwise if you're nailing off to a wooden floor, then you're going to nail your bottom plate off. Where are you going to nail it off, Matt? Every stud. Every stud and or over top of the trusses. So if you guys are going to, if you guys are nailing through, typically you go through and you'll nail it next to every stud. Keeps it out of the way for any plumbers, electricians that are coming through and drilling holes directly through the bottom. Um, also, yeah, you want to nail into the trusses, or, uh, so we have floor trusses on this, um, but lots of houses have joists, so mm -hmm. nail into the floor joists, and then that way it goes, penetrates through that three quarter and gets a little bit of grab on that uh, truss as well, or joist. So nail that off, um, tie in your intersecting walls from there. So usually if you're building like an interior set of walls, sorry, I'm just going to burn up a little bit more time here. You want to, uh, rather than stand one, if you're standing a wall into a wall that's not level, you, you want to pull numbers. And what I mean by that is if the wall is yet to be braced and you have a series of walls that are stood and nailed together, you want to make sure that the bottom measurement is going to be the same at the top. And then when you level those or rack those into plumb, then they're all going to come into plumb together at the same time. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I wish that I could give you guys a visual. We don't have all night to go through and build an entire place, but um, time your intersecting walls, then you're going to plumb your wall. So what I mean by plumb, you're going to suck a level on the edge, and make sure that it gets right in between those two lines at the, the water level, and then you're going to brace it off. You brace it off. If it's if, it, if you're doing a, a brace that goes right across the wall or like that, what would you call that brace? Diagonal yeah. brace. Diagonal brace, rack brace, sway brace. One of those braces. You're going to brace it off that way, and that way it's going to hold this wall straight up and down like that. And then all your studs are going to be nice and level going up and down, nice and plumb. And then you're going to want to brace the wall coming down one way or the other. So this is the outside of the house. Sometimes people will drive stakes into the outside and they'll nail off a 16 foot 2 by 4 on either side and then they'll push and pull the wall in so that that sits nice and level and nail that off as well. So you want it to be level on all the sides. Okay, so after that's all done, uh, when it's all said and done, then you want to top plate everything together. Um, so back to this drying, if you have something like this, and these two walls are connected like this, and you don't have, so there's always two top plates. Usually you wanna, you're gonna wanna run this very top plate right here all the way through so that it connects onto that wall. And so then it's tying those two walls together completely. So you can do that, and then maybe there's another wall right there. Even You can even tie that one in just like that, and then you kind of fill in your spaces. 
Um, it says on this sheet, and it's a rule that I am kind of a sticker by, if you guys work with me. Um, so wherever you connect two walls together, so if there's another wall right here, like that, and you go to do, so that's the first top plate, and you go to put your second top plate on, you always want to make sure that you guys are going to go at least four feet over either side, and you also want to be breaking those on top of a stud. So, and that way you're properly connecting these two walls together. So lots of these prefab walls that we get out here, they send a bunch of like little blocks and stuff. And so maybe there's a block right there that's like that's like that big, and then there's another one. Sometimes they do it right, and that's four foot, and they have like a four foot piece there, and that's sufficient, I guess. Um, I I don't like it. I'd much rather use longer lumber to completely go across that span and tie this wall in together as much as possible. At least four foot though on either side and it has to break over on top of that. Some people will let it fly, if it doesn't, I don't. It's gotta be breaking over top of that. Zach knows that, right? <laughs> okay, so anyways, uh, I'm just gonna burn through this real quick. The, so tools you guys are gonna need, they, for the most part, circular saw, skill saw, uh, uh, sawzall, nail gun, staple gun, ram set or powder, nailer, whatever you guys have if you're going into concrete. You're going to need a level, um, plumb bob if you guys are really old school. Uh, that's a story for a different day. Lots of, that's kind of gone by the wayside. People don't use plumb bobs that much uh, anymore. I mean, I, I, don't know, I like to use them. I like to use them. They're, they come very... You guys know what a plumb bob is? Yeah, if it's windy, you're gonna be standing there forever. Exactly. <laughs> they make lasers now where you can just shoot a laser up in the air and find out where it is. But it's a weight that's attached to a string, and the gravity of the earth makes it plumb. Makes whatever point you're trying to find plumb. So people use them a lot for like decks. If you want to put a post underneath the corner of a deck, you can drop a plumb bob, and right where that settles and winds up winds up sitting straight up and down with no wind, of course. <laughs> then that's going to be the center of wherever your whatever mark you're trying to plumb down. So there's that, and then the required tools for framing, the ones that you guys are going to come across, uh, that essential, you want, you're going to want a chalk line, you're going to want a tape measure, you're going to want a speed square, you're going to want a hammer for sure, get a hammer, a uh, cat's paw, um, chisel. a chisel, always like to carry a chisel with me. Works out great. Sometimes a crescent wrench comes in handy, a set of pliers or channel locks. Um, I wanted to borrow a Phillips screwdriver from one of you guys one day last week. Nobody had one. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not a needed tool. You're going to have to go ask the electricians. <laughs> you don't, uh, they don't usually don't screw things yeah. together too often. But also, yes, we do use impacts and, and uh, usually drills for the most part. Um, not too often do we use screwdrivers to do a lot of little components like that. Um, but yes, so that's basically where we're at. If you guys want to step outside real quick, we can go through building the wall. Um, 